phrase is like, I have a dream, meant something. I grew up where I believed that freedom existed, that that's what I was fighting for. I believed that the Statue of Liberty was a symbol of our liberty, that we all came from all over the world, because we didn't want to live underneath the monarchy, that our founding fathers made America the land of the free and the land of the brave. I don't care what you say to me. I don't care if there's a shadow government or there's people out there that's trying to take it away from us. This is America, damn it, and I'm taking it back. And now your host, Terry Joyce. All right. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the Freedom of Joyce show here on American Freedom Radio. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, the date is uh, December 7th, 2017, and we are 2 p.m. on the Pacific Coast, 5 p.m. on the East Coast, and it's 22, 22 uh, hours, uh, I think, on military time. So uh, if you are here, uh, we do have a great show coming up. Uh, my guest today uh, you may know him from the Basis Project. Uh, his name is Miles Johnston. Uh, he's the creator of the Basis Project. I've been watching uh, the Basis Project for a long time, and so I'm very excited to have him here, uh, first time on the Freedom of Joyce show on American Freedom Radio. Uh, welcome to the show, Miles. Well, hello. How are you? From, I'm doing... uh, from Wiltshire in England. Wow. It's so exciting, I think, that we can communicate so easily now all over the all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, freezing cold here, and we're getting snow, apparently. But that's what we talk about on the island of the British Isles, England. Oh. Yeah. We do that. We talk about the weather. Yeah, you talk about the weather. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, our weather here in uh, I'm in Southern California, uh, Long Beach. Uh, the it was a little bit sunny during the day, but it picks gets colder at night. We're having winds. I don't know if you're familiar, but we're having big fires uh, happening in the Ventura, California area. And, and I, uh, I gather there's nothing controversial about that. They're just no, happening oh. naturally, and it's part of evil global warming because you drive a car with gasoline in it. That's right, exactly. And you are personally responsible for the woes of all the world, and there's no way that there's any other kind of conspiracy involved here. Absolutely. Uh, and and there's a, also there's a, a fire that broke out near the Getty Museum, and uh, that has a big conspiracy around it uh, at the moment. So, uh, why? Uh, I, mean, that's, I mean, any museum... I know there's lots of things about museums and what goes, which is displayed and which isn't and what's written, but I mean, uh, that's not good at all. Well, see, here's the deal. Um, there is an ex-CIA NSA contractor uh, named Stephen D. Kelly who uh, has uh, was uh, uh, making uh, laser guns uh, during the Ollie North um, administration, and um, you know he has a whole he wrote a book and everything. And so he comes out with the Getty Museum being uh, connected to the underground bases. It's one of the focal points uh, near the uh, Skirball Center uh, as well. And uh, that there, he claims that there are uh, that they have um, they're holding uh, child sex slaves underneath there. And uh, he did a uh, they did a whole uh, psychic astro plane attack on the psychics, uh, literally um, you know like a, a week and a half ago. And uh, which now, uh, of course, if you're following what's going on in America, there's that whole there's a whole QAnon. Uh, 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 character going on. Are you familiar with all that? Well, actually, no, but I'm familiar with uh, the attacks on so-called, so what you, what you would call psychic people, but people are basically waking up and not being not doing what they're told. There's a lot of that going on, and there's been a lot of that going on with radio frequency uh, types of attacks for 30, 40, 50 years, at least. Yeah. To try and catch the uh, the wave of people waking up, and uh, it's um, you know it's not it's not good. But I'm not familiar with that particular attack. 
on the museum. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a, the, well, the the psychics apparently the the Getty Museum is protected by, uh, according to Stephen, Nazi psychics to make sure that it doesn't, you know, get you know, it's protected that way. And uh, they, you know, they're con- uh, connected to the elites and everything. And they, uh, according to him, they have all the all the good stuff down there, the technology. Well, you've you've mentioned two things. Uh, my um, new age baloney alarm has just come on, and you did mention the word good. And I better not say much more than no. that. Does it have an E in the end of it? Because that, to me, is um, the kind of stuff which is put out to um, cause so much confusion and fear that uh, it's actually, I be, I think it's nefarious, bluntly. Now, that's that's just my intuition on that. That gets people into a spiral of fear and anxiety, and the only people who benefit from that kind of a, a, a thing are the enemy itself. So I would be careful about the. I mean, I use a lot of sarcasm with the stuff I do because, uh, and some of it goes over people's goes over people's heads. Uh, but I sort of would tend to. I take the first person I usually parody or or discredit is myself. Because I tell people, A, not to take me seriously, and B, don't believe anything I say. Do not believe anything. Because belief is outsourcing your common sense and your ability to make your own judgment and decisions. By all means, take account of what's being said. Be aware. Take it on board. But don't blindly obey it. All you're doing is replacing one obedient uh, belief system with another and the new age movement which was uh, very well engineered in California in the 1960s uh, and probably a lot earlier and a lot of the, 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 the so called um, channeling great gurus of the 1930s were all psychobabble, all rubbish and um, it's been well played as a rouge and a routine for a long time now, because they knew this was going to start happening in the 1930s, and they basically set the stage to start undermining anybody started waking up. Well, that's that. I, I, well, I'm, I'm glad that you pointed that out uh, because there's definitely a uh, a new age connection to all of this information. And, uh, there is a, uh, you know, there's a, a 4chan, uh, has been, uh, there's a, 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 an informant named QAnon, apparently, that is divulging a lot of information, uh, you know, saying things that, uh, you know, there was an, uh, uh, the CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia, uh, what, you know, our military came in and took computers and there were arrests being made and things like this. And, you know, there, well, it, I, it, I, I was listening to Simon Parks on that. And um, what happened was merely an overfly of Marines who uh, simply were letting anybody in the CIA who would have. Uh, maybe disingenuous uh, loyalties um, uh, to know that how easy it is just for armed forces loyal to the president. Um, and I'm not poli- I don't want to be political on this, but you you have a country run by an elected officer, as by th- you know the democracy of the people. And when a one bunch of people don't like that, they decide they want to assassinate and murder that individual. And I don't think that's good for anybody's democracy. You may not agree with the result of an election. The election is flawed. There's all sorts of things wrong with it. But when you've got an election, you respect the result and live together as one people, not screaming and yelling and hating each other and wanting to shoot everybody. That does not serve any individual country, uh, country's interests. You vote for somebody. If you don't want them, then you vote them out. Uh, now I, that's the I theory. That's the theory of of democracy. But yes. every single time an American president is elected, the first thing happens is a whole bunch of comedians starts spewing out this vile diatribe of them. I, I mean, who needs Nazis, communism, and uh, and horrible, nasty, uh, evil dictators from China or Vietnam when 
I don't know you guys, but from an outside point of view, once an election happens in the States, I don't know how Democrats and Republicans can walk down the same street. <laughs> it, it seems to be a, a, a theater which is constantly played to absolutely hate each other's guts. Now, that does not serve any country any good. That's my po personal opinion on them. And coming from Northern Ireland, I know about things like that. Well, I agree with you, and I, I, it's, it's refreshing to hear your viewpoint about what's going on over here. Uh, now, uh, a lot of people, this is my opinion, that that is uh, fueled by the media, uh, and the media has yeah. uh, an and agenda. The media, yeah, absolutely, yeah. and I've worked in television, uh, and I've worked in broadcasting for most of my life, either with a license or without a license. And the broadcast regulators have got something to answer these days. The scale of disinformation and blatant lying going on in the media is meant to be governed by um, the, well, in this country we call it Ofcom. And they sit on very high tables with very high chairs with very high opinions of themselves. And they regulate broadcasting in this country, in the, in the UK, and they're as guilty as hell in terms of maintaining lies, deceit, and disinformation in the media. And they, they are, I mean, the media, okay, a particular broadcaster may have an opinion, a particular newspaper may have an opinion, and they may express that opinion, and that opinion may be wrong or differs to other people's opinion. Well, if you have plurality and you have different stations or different media saying this view and that view, that's good. That's great. But when you have a universal uh, condemnation of what I mean, in, in this country we had it against a, 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 a small political party called UKIP, and everybody was amazed. How could this possibly happen that this person uh, is voted in and they get such a success? Because we've all the all the newspapers, all the broadcasters, every comedy show on the BBC, every there's every nuance is written into scripts in completely uh, non-partisan, uh, so-called partisan uh, shows and comedies and soap operas, putting a dig in against one particular type or group in the political sphere. And that is blatant public manipulation, and it's blatant uh, disenfranchising of what's meant to be a free-thinking liberal, or you're not liberal, I don't like to use that trigger word, democracy, <laughs> where you have lots of different views, people express them. And when the media get it so wrong again and again, and they keep talking and talking themselves up, and there's a huge story possibly going to break in this country, uh, and the newspapers who are part of this problem are going to, the public does not believe a word that the, 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 the number of people buying newspapers is collapsing. And then any other newspaper which comes up with independent views or actually does anything called research or investigation are being slandered, grossly defamed and slandered as fake news. And this is a very serious problem. It's a very Instead. serious problem, and and we we you know especially with this particular presidency, uh, we are seeing a, a lot of disinformation going on, and ironically, uh, this particular president, uh, if you're talking about people who are waking up, there's a whole demographic of people that I think have voted for him that probably um, maybe have watched Basis Project, you know that they uh, they they do feel well, that 9/11 yeah. was an inside job. You know, and so that there, there he is kind of um, he's thrown, I believe, the the cabal off. You know, they wanted Hillary. And yeah. uh, and so, you know, we're really seeing how Hollywood and the media, because Hollywood owns 90 uh, percent of the mainstream media and uh, they were and they and they have a huge. Uh, and again, I'm using the, the, the trigger word here, but um, the media is considered to be li liberal. Uh, they have a, oh God, all no. of our entertainers have a liberal uh, a Democrat stance. And uh, so. When you see our comedians and even comedians from England, like, you know, John Oliver over here on our side, um, it's, it's, they're basically propaganda puppets, really. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's I an mean, I, 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 I went first, I'm a big fan of American broadcast radio. I've got, I think, maybe 80 real to real archive tapes that I recorded in the 1970s and 80s on a Revox reel to reel machine. 
that's real audio, not not the stuff you get the MP3 encoded psycho babble stuff. And I love the attitude of the American shock jocks. I like the the music, the way it was played. Really admired it in this side of the world. Uh, loved it. I loved uh, a lot of the early. Uh, I, lo- I loved uh, Johnny Car- the Carson show, the Late Late Show, uh-huh. and uh, and those show. They were uh, they were good television. Because it was based on vaudeville, it was based on show business, it was based on radio drama, which came from the 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 uh, the, ver- the various uh, dance and or not halls, but the, the um, you know the, before they had steam wireless, as they call it, and um, that was good. They had immediate public reaction. They had local, uh, you know, you know, you'd be thrown off stage or whatever it is. It was good stuff. But what's happened since uh, since then is that media's got so up its backside in psychobabble and control. They don't know what... If you ask somebody in uh, in media, is today Thursday? And you need a direct answer. Is it Thursday or is it Friday? They actually go into a sort of a puzzlement. They can't actually answer the question. Uh-huh. They are so head, you know, nulled, to use a more polite term. And this is this is a very serious problem, which is why my be- the benefit that I have, I've been in pirate radio. We uh, thirty years ago I put up a Kiss FM uh, in Monaghan, put a million watts across the Irish border, because in Northern Ireland we couldn't have anything like that. We had to have the established, mind-numbingly dull local radio station as imposed by the government. It was meant to be an independent, but it was the only independent. It was the monopoly of independence along the BBC's monopoly of, I mean, it just, that's all you have. Uh, so this is where we find that uh, in the 1970s and 80s, Ireland was awakening. And that's why the last conference they put on was Ireland Awakens. And then people say, well, awakened, we didn't know we were asleep. But they've radically changed. And this could be happening in America. Uh, last night I worked out that the president that the United States requires right now is exactly what you've got. You cannot have a pre- a better president, forget the name, but what you have as a president is exactly the most good thing that could ever happen in the United States since it became a United States. Because everybody is so completely confused by the actions of Trump, they're completely, you can't say that. He did say that. Did he say that? He can't <laughs> use tweet. Oh, God, he's not using tweet. It hasn't gone through the right office. He can't do that. What, who, who wants to, he, he's done what? Everybody hasn't a clue. And then Hillary, Hillary uh, did a great tour. I actually thought, I actually favored Hillary as a president. I think she would have done a great job in an acting role, re- acting that out and being, you know, a good president. In fact, I think six six years ago, seven years ago, there were sort of there were shows uh, pushing it ahead in the future that we would expect Hillary would be president, but we hadn't watched The Simpsons, and as we know, The Simpsons are the only is the only bastion of true original thought in the <laughs> world, because as we know, a person with a familiar hairstyle wasn't The Simpsons, along with all the nine eleven predictive stuff was all on The Simpsons. <laughs> you know, if you want to know what's going on. Watch The Simpsons, but don't watch the reruns. And I think since they've gone high, high def, it's not the same. Um, but that's actually a serious point. Somebody knows what the script is, and they're writing it, and they're telling us about it. But that's another story. Yes, yeah, that 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 is that is another story. Uh, well, you know what? I'm. It's refreshing again to hear you uh, speak uh, highly of of our president that we have right now. Um, I, I mean, it's good fun. We- I mean, he's not my president. Well, but I, I think you know it's good fun. It's good fun from a from a point of view of seeing these uh, journalists and other individuals on on air make a fool of themselves. Yeah, you know, they they really are, and they're showing themselves up for for how completely out of touch and disingenuous uh, that they, they are. I mean, I, some of the good old school anchormen of 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 old, I had a lot of time for, and you know, maybe they. Shake a few hands and walk around with a a trouser leg up, and maybe eat the raw, the odd child or so. But uh, or have I just gone too far? 
Well, what do you think uh, about all of our uh, sexual uh, discussions that are coming out um, with, uh, you know, like some of our speaking of, of broadcasters, you know, Matt Lauer, Charlie Rose, uh, they've they've been uh, put out on the on the on the table here, including um, Al Franken. And we have this. My, I'll tell you what my opinion is. My opinion is, is that it is uh, it, it's it's odd that it's all happening at once. Uh, I, I because of the fact that they're nailing it, it, it like driving it so hard, uh, it looks like an agenda, uh, which uh, is to bring in uh, a, a male female, uh, you know, like a, like sort of a feminism going on. Like you know, again, it's it's the white man. The white man should be punished. Uh, he's also a sexual predator. Uh, well, and you know, to, this, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, that's my thought about it. And it's also covering up uh, the bigger picture, which is the um, the child per, uh, pedophilia that's going on in Hollywood and with um, our government as well. That I think it's, I, I, you know, that's my opinion. What do you think about it? Well, uh, John Irwin, and one of these days, John Irwin is going to get the funding for this film that he needs. Uh, John Irwin is somebody I interviewed. He actually came to me and said, Miles, can you interview me? Uh, now John Irwin is a 75, 76 year old um, former military specialist who um, was very carefully and precisely born in 1939. His, um, that's John Irwin with a U. And his mother in Newcastle upon Tyne, now that's up north, folks, in England. That's, that's, that's proper up north. On the East Coast, um, he, his mother left the family home, uh, gone two or three months. Uh, uh, her husband was mad as hell and uh, you know, where are you and putting adverts up and all sorts of things. And you're talking very poor working class, good, honest, laboring uh, uh, workers in the steel and shipbuilding industry up in uh, the Newcastle upon Tyne. And then she turns up. And she turns up pregnant. Now, this means something very important. Uh, John Irwin was artificially fathered with that particular lady so that 17 years later, in 1950, uh, in 1957, he would uh, be ready to uh, join an elite, very small military force called the 16. Now, this means a great deal. This is huge as to why he was born, why that particular woman was chosen, and why those particular times were involved as to why he came into this world and was born and joined. When they had, uh, in the 1950s, Britain still had conscription, so he had to join the military. Young lad goes in there, age 17, and he's in the military, and bingo. He meets a strange, very pale um, officer in Malta, and um, he's in the Mediterranean, and he's taken uh, past death. And we can talk about Max Spears, and we can talk about all those sort of things. So he is engineered to go past death and be specially trained. Now, we've Already gone through this with Sean Stone. Sean Stone came over and met him, and they were going to make a movie. It didn't work out, and uh, that's between John and Sean and the, the various company that was involved with that. But this means that in 1957, the British military were engineering soldiers to be trained by a special-looking kind of white, hey, very pale uh, officer, in a special fighting technique and also, and this is going to be the subject of this movie that has to be made and we need a lot of money to do this. It needs to be done urgently now. He was trained by bringing his being. He died. He went through the death process and then inhabited the body of other genetically related parts of him in different dimensions and times during the history of the world and that learnt him a lot uh, to use a, a, an incromatic term so he then came back was reborn, this is all in a three day training session, he was then trained with an extremely special form of combat called the machine and then 
after four days, he was released back into the into the British military, where he then took full uh, part with this secret British group called the Sixteen, and they fought in four groups of four. And running along very speedily, after bumping off a lot of Russians and a lot of people in the Middle East and the Lebanon and what became uh, the Middle East today and Egypt and things like that, with this special fighting technique, they got two data banks, two extremely old data banks from our past, which contained huge amounts of information. And this had a reader, and you could see what was on that. And that information has translated itself into a lot of the secret esoteric 9-11 type energy weapons that we are using today and are probably being used to start some of the fires in California. And that is why he wrote a book. And the book is One Step Beyond. That refers to One Step Beyond Death and the 16. So this guy's birth was planned to do this in the 1930s, which means the British secret intelligence people knew they were going to have to fight an interdimensional war, which is what's happening right now, which means outside 3D, and that is why you asked that question. The first thing you do when you are going to take out any species is you attack the, pr the, the primary male. You take that male down. You take the dominant male down. And that's what's happening sexually. That's why we have the sex crime. George Orwell taught us this. He told us this. Right? So we right. have the sex crime, and that's what's happening right now, because a predator that is not human is taking us out right now, and people need to wake up. Wow. Thank you, Miles. I, You know, you have just opened a whole nother reality for myself. For me, personally, I went... Oh. <laughs> now, another very fine lady called Jane, um, who's former Royal Navy, very eloquent, very, very uh, well-spoken and intelligent woman. Her mother uh, downloaded an awful lot of this stuff, uh, and she's writing uh, her book. I don't like to be sort of sound as if I'm flogging books, but it's information. Now, she spoke at Basis about six months ago. It was actually when Vanessa Bates, uh, Max Spears' mother, did her first uh, public statement, very heavily guarded due to certain individuals in the room and what she could say and what she can't say. Because again, Max was taken beyond death and they tried engineering his uh, energetics and it didn't work, which is, oh. why they, what, this is why the shit hit the fan on this. He died twice. Uh, and I said that on BBC Radio 4, so this is not news, folks. It's just you may not have heard it that way before. So the point about this is that what Irwin is talking about is the crucial element when a child is created in the womb and it grows is the pineal gland reaches a certain stage and it will start singing. And that, now this is what he was trained in. This is what he was taught. This is what he was told. Now, Jane referred to this as well. Now, what happens with this process is the wrong, what they are deliberately doing is they are interfering with the ability of human energetic spirits or souls, whatever you want to call it, to actually enter a human body. And the first signature of that process going wrong is when a female designated female soul enters a designated male body and vice versa. That's to say a male uh, body or male designated soul, whatever process happens to us when we're before we're born, something tells us we're meant to be a man or something tells us we're meant to be a, a, a woman. And then we're, the, the idea is the man's soul goes into the man's body and the woman's soul goes into the woman's body. We live in a duality. You then have uh, heterosexual sex. You then procreate, and it's called living and having children, right? Right. Now, what is happening is this process is being engineered to fail by a predator. We are being interfered with before we're even being born so that people are finding themselves in the wrong bodies. Now, Jane discussed this, and there were a number of gay individuals in the audience and she struck a chord with those individuals, and they were very emotionally 
touched by what she had to say, because she was saying the same thing as John Irwin. Now, what goes even further than this, that the wrong energy being entirely is now going into human bodies, and they are finding themselves in a bipedal, uh, you know, two arms, two legs body, completely wrong. I mean, if you think at least you're human, and you find yourself in a physical body, you wake up and you're the wrong body. Okay, at least being male and being female, okay, well, at least you're still human. But what's happening now is that this corruption of the pineal signature within the physical body is getting so off-skewed, the wrong physical entity is going into the body. And I interviewed a guy who, um, at David Icke's The People's Voice, it was a wonderful time to be at the startup of A People's Voice with David Icke and a fantastic team of volunteers. It was very brief. It was a wonderful place to be and to be in that environment. There's a whole lot of politics happened there. I'm not going to go into it. But what David Icke did and his team was to put a TV station on the air with £300,000 worth of publicly raised money. And that was a big deal. And hats off to David Icke for doing that. And again, I'm not going into the politics of TV stations, why they failed. There's a whole book on that. You don't, I don't need to go into it now. Uh, but there was a guy there who was so heavily tattooed with his hair and all sorts of places and full body disfigurement. Because what's happening now is that physical beings aren't in the right bodies. And this means all physical life on this planet Nature itself, Mother Nature itself, is under full-scale attack from a predator, and it's taking us out. We are facing extinction, and when Elon Musk warns that we are facing existential extinction, I would suggest we pay some attention to what somebody like that. He's a new kid on the block, he's a new guy, uh, and he's part of the new generation of of bright young kids who actually have a brain in their head and are thinking. And we really have to start paying attention with extreme urgency on this. We don't have much time on this. Uh, yeah, it, it seems like it's kind of happening very rapidly. Uh, and and uh, Elon Musk, is, is I've, I've been uh, watching what he's been saying and his warnings uh, about uh, AI intelligence uh, you know, we're seeing, uh, and it, right now, I, there's a new thing on Skype where it's, there's a what, Cortana or something like that. I, I, I haven't, that's it's Windows annoying 10. to me. Yeah. It's like, do you want her to like think for you now? No, I don't think so. <laughs> well, this is, the, this is one of the point. There's a, there's a guy in Ireland who I keep forgetting the name, but he's worked out. He came up independently on this. Uh, Michael Sher Sheridan, I think his name is. Um, he's a, a radio guy and a lot of the radio amateurs, a lot of radio broadcast, analog amplitude modulated broadcast types have, have started to sus see something wrong was happening. Um, one of the things about amplitude modulated broadcasting is it's a very good brainwave telepathic carrier. And that is why BBC Radio 1's music, pop music station in Britain, the network in Britain, Radio 1, was kept on AM for so long. 30 years after you had FM, the BBC main network stayed on for pop music. Music radio, the one that you really need all the fidelity in Britain, they still had that on AM until 1988. Could you believe that? Now, what they were doing those nasty little creatures which are inhabiting the BBC and take control, and I know the BBC have been there. There's a lot of nasty stuff going on in there. They play a lot of games. A lot of them don't know what the hell they're playing, but they play them. Now, what's going on there is a form of psychotronic mind control and I, I, involving the manipulation of human thought and human intelligence through broadcasting. Okay, a lot of people understand that. No big deal. The problem is when the digits come and they switch at 90 degrees and a number of people have noticed this problem. 
uh, everything we have in the world is fundamentally balanced in harmonics and with a mathematical algorithm which is fundamentally got a relationship. You've got cows, sheep, fish, dinosaurs, birds, just about everything is basically the same shape. You've got a head, you've got a bipedal thing, uh, maybe you don't use the top and four legs are the same thing, but they're really roughly the same. That's got a mathematical algorithm which produces 3D reality, right? Uh huh. The problem about, and there's a relationship with that in the harmonics through different energetic subbands and frequencies, and, and that, we don't want to go too detailed on this, but this, it's mathematical. It all works. All the, the tune, if you played the music, the music would, would be in tune. You would have a harmonic sound. You'd have something which, which would make a nice song. The digits are 90 degree hard switching signals, and that's a problem. Everything we've got switches at 30 to 60 degrees in terms of a wave of energy when it comes and moves around. Um, if you go to the full 90 degrees with analog, you get hard distortion and it sounds bad. But if we, if, uh, audio files, if you go and play that distortion into a valve amplifier or tube, tube amplifier, the distortion even then is softer. But once you go to digits, you get a hard distortion. And a hard distortion is unpleasant because it's mathematically incompatible with the physical existence of what we're in. Now, if something's mathematically incompatible with the existence of what we're in, it ain't from around here, folks. Can you get that? Can you get that? Yeah, I get it. I get it. I do, and I that get it. Now that means computer technology is computer technology is fundamentally the way we use it. Agent intelligence technology. And we handing over every single thing that we have existence computers. We are creating robots. We are creating cyborgs. And we are creating man's replacement. And it's incompatible with the reality and the fundamentals of nature in this world. Now that has come from somewhere else. And we are in trouble with this. So and this is Elon the Terminator, Musk mentioned this. I, no, it's me. not the Terminator. This is the fundamentals of the way that the digital signal physically... Remember these digital signals, what are they doing? When you uh, write a letter, you write a letter uh, with a pen and you put it on a piece of paper and you write words on it, Right? Right. You put that in an envelope and you post it to somebody and they open it up and read the letter. Today, I went up the hill and I fell in love with Jack. Jack and Jill went down the hill and they fell in love, right? Uh -huh. Now, that is conveying two people. They fall in love, but it's only words written on a piece of paper. But in that, there's a whole picture. There's a whole emotion. There's a whole feeling of warmth and loveliness in that. And it's only just words written on a bit of paper. But that bit of paper is carrying that word, that, that sympathy, that empathy is in the paper. It's in there. There's something else there other than just the bit of paper and the writing. Do you get me? Yes. You following this? Yeah, I do. So when there is some other essence in those words, and if you're clever, and people are clever, they can write a letter which can convey that. They can piggyback a signal in the bottom of that and they can get somebody to suddenly click and uh, go and shoot somebody. That's why with the mind control aspects, they get people to read certain textbooks with certain stories. Alice in Wonderland, The Yellow Brick Road, all these things produce a nice, happy, slappy dream state. Or You, you get this, but they can you can piggyback another signal in there. Okay? Uh-huh. So, and that's clever. It's it's subliminal essence of hiding an idea within the text, but it's still just a piece of text written on paper. The problem is, and this is a problem, 
you put that onto a computerized digital signal, the fundamental aspects of that signal of a 90 degree signal going up and hard switching in 90 degrees, I'm telling you 90 degrees because once you do a switch, 90 degrees is switching the essence of that signal into a different dimensional domain. So computer technology is immediately a leaky medium and somebody else in another domain is accessing it. So every single thing that you've been putting into a computer system is going somewhere else in non-locality, non-local space time, outside 3D. We're talking to somebody else and it's got control on this domain and we are handing over every single thing we have to that technology. So if you're in the NSA and you've got all the codes because you cannot transmit a single thing on this planet unless the NSA has the key to that code. Mr. NSA, Mr. CIA, Mr. KGB, you do not have control of that technology. And if you think you've got control of that technology, you are on cloud cuckoo land. And a few people have woken up to that, which means we have lost control of ourselves, which means the main transmission mediums are compromised, the main data storage mediums are compromised, every single transmission facility and television broadcast system, computer system, everything is compromised. We have given our entire existence away to something else we don't even know is there. And that's why we have pirate radio, because we saw it on both sides of the coin, and we could see this sort of stuff. And they're not good, nice things. So that's what's going on, folks. So what we have to develop, we have to develop a computer technology which will operate within the, 90, within the basic mathematical configuration of this 3D time space. And somebody better get developing that and get developing it damn fast because we're going to need that if we're going to survive this. And that's the bottom line. How does this relate to 5G? A lot of people are talking about 5G and what's going to happen if but 5G... All 5G is, and all 4G is, and all 3G is, and all 2G and 1G and whatever, it's just another method of transmitting on those digital signals. Now, one of the other guys I interviewed was a guy called Gabe Cruz. And he put in the analog mobile phone network in the Pacific Northwest. He was one of the key design engineers in the install and run it. And he worked this out. What this technology is doing, and because they're pushing up to 5G, because 5G is really only just merging into what was previously analog television domain, right? right? It's where you had to make digital television, because digital television used the old analog transmission frequencies. So, well, we've got to switch off the analog system and switch on the digital system, so we're going to reuse all those frequencies very efficiently with all this transmission coding. Now, I'm a broadcast engineer, and most broadcast engineers, probably 99.8%, think I'm probably talking hooey because they're not looking at the signal within the noise. What's happening here is that they have designed a transmission medium. Uh, in the good old days of the Montauk project, they would talk about window frequencies within the FM band. They specifically chose FM broadcast radio, which would contain music. Um, and the meaning, when somebody goes on the air and they're playing a, a record and they're talking to you with your radio at the other end, you're listening to that person and your attention is listening to that DJ and he's playing the music and the music, and then of course they encoded the music. Coral Canyon. I mean, half the music coming, probably 80, 90% of the music coming out of California, United States was 100% mind control. 100% psychobabble, screw your head in the music, mind control. And a lot of the individuals in those bands were 100% CIA or belonged to one dodgy organization or other. They were using it with nefarious intent, and that's enough. Now, what was going on was that was working in the analog domain, and we can fight that back. We can deal with that. 
Uh, that's one of the aspects of pirate broadcasting is that the pirate, the DJ, was able to overrun the psychobabble put in the music with his mind as he played it. And that's why they did like Radio Caroline in the UK. In the UK, we had a ship that had to go out into the sea to transmit some records because they couldn't do it on land because the free British broadcasting environment, you, you know, was so wonderful and great. They would not allow that. They would not allow uh, even the other broadcast stations in the 1950s and 30s broadcasting music into, into, Brit, into Britain. They were banned. They were, oh, we can't listen to that because they were using the broadcast system as a mechanism of population control. Okay? What they've done now is they've simply brought 5G. I'm just using this as an example. They've brought what were analog window frequencies into the mind and into the human psyche, and they're now bringing this nasty piece of digital stuff. Now, the point about the digital stuff is, as Gabe Cruz found out, as he had an 800 megahertz transmitter on his back, 2.3 gigahertz frequency transmitter, and then another lower band set of frequencies, which is all too boring for the average listener. But when you mix those on the band, when you transmit all of that over the wave bands collectively, what we find is that there are lots of natural energetic frequencies our brains work to, that the nature works to. They all live in this wonderful world of electromagnetic spectrum and they all emit signals and they all have things in their synapses of their brains and we all have electrical signals running around everywhere. A lot of people looked at the primary carrier signal, the big fat power signal that broadcasts the main signal of whatever you're talking about. It could be your cell phone frequencies, whatever. It's not the big carrier signal that's the problem. What they've been doing is they've been specifically designing signals, little small baby, tiny little signals which pulse at certain rates, which mimic very closely aspects of the way our brains work and the way that other living things work. You know, like the honeybee, stuff like that. And not, and the point is they, they don't actually have the signal on the, the same frequency as our brains would actually work at. They have it close to it. So what happens is the brain or the mind or your neural app, your neural network starts being pulled into a different frequency domain, which is not natural. And that changes people. So this is an extremely insidious, extremely nefarious situation we're walking into. And it makes us compliant and under control. And us baby boomers are the last generation who've seen both sides of this. And we don't have much time because we're all going to drop dead soon. And that's the situation at the moment. Well, there are baby boomers that actually um, started with radio. Uh, you know, my mother is uh, falls underneath the uh, baby boom uh, category. Uh, has she died yet? Because no, she could, she's still uh, in, in the alive. UK, the, the baby boomers should just die. Well, they they're used for being too happy, States. far too happy, and they are taking far too many, too much money from their children. They should just politely die and give the money to their children, and uh, just move along. Yeah, no, they want to get rid of I, the, the same sentiment is here. You know, it's once you start to, you know, even hit the, you know, 40, 50 year old range, 40, you've got, you know, maybe another 10 years, you know, and 50, uh, you're pretty much like, you know, when can you, here's a bunch of drugs you can take. Uh, exactly. We're going to make money yeah. off of you. Yeah. And, and, and uh, then, you know, and you're whatever, you know, we hope you die before your retirement finishes. Oh, absolutely. For God's sake, don't pick up your, your, your paycheck on retirement. That's the last thing they want you to do. Yeah. Because they've spent it. They've stolen it. But, you know, to think about, I think sometimes like what my mother, you know, from going from radio and listening to radio shows and then going to television and then going to uh, cell phones like we do now uh, is, is, a, is a huge leap in, 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 in her lifetime. And, and that is the baby boomer, really. Yeah, well, they've, we can see, or they can see the perspective. I mean, I'm a, I think I'm a late baby boomer. 
uh, caused a lot of trouble. You know, I was born and the space race started. That's what happened. Or the space fake race, but we don't go into that. But this is the, this is the aspect of population management, population control. The, the, but the other thing that they, they put in is they, oh, you've got to fear 5G, you've got to fear digital TV, you got to, that's all they, all they want is fear. They just soak that up off us. And that's, that's what they do with a lot of this stuff. And rather than fear everything, simply understand it. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the dark. You know, we, if we didn't have the dark, we wouldn't have the light. You know, that's the duality thing. So just because something's dark doesn't make it bad. You know, just like when we did the Amash project, um, which I, I was asked to uh, do a lot of interviews uh, with a team of people, which was uh, run by an individual who uh, unfortunately uh, had some other other ideas. Um we started recording a whole lot of these witnesses, and uh, that was a major thing. We ended up with uh, two TV, uh, a ma- major network television documentary on that, and uh, subsequently, basis is itself. I, you know, I've been going since 1995 on this with the underground bases in England, making aliens based on a German derivative, and then of course you got the black goo in there, and we've just found out that um, the island, Thule Island. Uh, in the South Atlantic, which was all part of this Falklands War, was a German submarine base in the nineteen in the in the war, and so were the Falklands. So the Germans had a submarine base, and uh, then Britain uh, got this stuff in 1982, and uh, they took it back to the UK, and it started killing people. And that's called the sentient fluid, otherwise known as the black goo. I want to uh, to talk about that. I would like to. um, We are going to go to, uh, um, we have about, um, let me see, at at the five to the hour. So we've got about four minutes before we take a break. Um, We'll take like a four minute break and then come back for for, for the second hour. But yeah, I would would love to discuss that. Um, Do you want to wait to bring it up later? You want to, can we, should we start right now? You think? No, I, I think once we start, it's, it's, it gets complicated because there's, there's new information okay. on that, and um, sure. there's at least two types, so we need to try and get that straight. Okay. Uh, well, why we have a, a couple, about three minutes uh, before before we go to break, uh, I'm just kind of, you know, I, I'm understanding that you were involved in, in radio broadcasting. Is that is that how you is that the, your evolution from going being in broadcasting? And then when did you? Well, we, we did pirate radio at my school. I was educated in an extremely expensive school called Campbell College in Northern Ireland, which is very upmarket, where the leaders of the world are created. Um, Public school, uh, and public school in the, in the states is what we would call um, anyway. It's it's private. It's it's where you you are paid to put you and I boarded there. And we had a radio station which we broadcast using the uh, the study block radiator system. Uh, long long bits of pipe with radiators on them are a very good way of propagating uh, AM radio. And we did that. But I missed in 1967. I missed the big radio stations. The biggest, most exciting thing in the 60s in Britain were these wonderful pirate stations. Okay, you had the Beatles, you had the miniskirt, uh, and you had Radio Caroline. And in the 1960s, and in Belfast, we had a guy called Terry Hooley, and another guy called Van Morrison. And we could speak about them, because in Belfast, people were waking up in the 1960s. And that was not in the interests of the Predator, which is why the provisional IRA was created by elements of British intelligence who were actually under the control of secret German intelligence. And uh, after that, it gets confusing. Uh, so the point about that is I've lost myself on this. Um, <laughs> the, we had a really exciting time. And in 1967, the government, run by Sir Anthony, uh, by the misery, pe- the misery people, Closed it all down. And then the only form of pop music radio we had in Britain for years was BBC Radio 1 on AM. And that's it. And then one or two of these little horrible, wimpish local stations came on, which were well, wet, drivel, and unbearable to listen to. All right. We're going to be right back with more Freedom of Joy. Stay tuned. We're going to, I'm with Miles Johnston, and we're going to talk about Black Goose. So don't go away.
America, damn it, and I'm taking it back. And now your host, Terry Joyce. Hi, uh, welcome back to the Freedom of Joyce show here on America Freedom Radio. Uh, I'd like to take a moment, too, to let you guys all know that uh, we are listener-supported, so please do support us here at the station. Uh, you can do that at AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Uh, we also have a Patreon account, so it would be wonderful if you would consider uh, being a regular patron of ours. Uh, thank you so much for listen to, listening to America Freedom Radio and supporting us as well. And I just want to let everybody know out there that my opening song, um, I don't have any um, codes or frequencies that will program your brain. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, That was done in a little booth in, in, the, in the state of Washington with my friends um, from Dot Com Records. So a shout out to Dot Com Records in uh, doing that. Uh, my my opening song. I don't know. It just made me think about it for a minute. I'm. I'm not. I'm not. We're not trying to program you here at America Freedom Radio. We're actually trying to uh, deprogram you, I guess. So. Uh, it, so I would like to. Hopefully, Miles uh, is back from break too as well. Miles Johnston, are you? Are you here? Yeah, that's uh, Miles at the Basis Project dot org. If you want to send me an email, Miles at M I L E S at the Basis Project dot org, and the website is the Basis Project dot org. Wow. Right. And well, I take I, money, I, shekels, Bitcoin, one coin, any coin. Oh, yeah. Don't get me started on Bitcoin. Uh, uh, yeah, but yeah, there's a major scam going on that, but uh, uh, well, they've exceeded their gold. They don't have the – anyway, we don't want to talk about that's another. Oh, thing. well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually um, – I've, I've got a little bit myself, so I'm not uh, – I'm not one of those, you know, it's, I, I haven't gone to like, you know, it's the mark of the beast. You know, I'm, I'm curious about it. Uh, again, you know, it is connected to all of our computers and everything. So, um, I mean, who knows? I'm, 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 I'm open into looking at. Well, uh, uh, yeah, I have one coin. We got money. We live in a real world with virtual money. Uh, but, uh, I mean, this is the thing. We, we have to be sensible. You, you have to be paid. You have to live. You have to, you know, pay for resources. And I get slammed a lot when I try to charge for any of the basis uh, stuff, uh, which gets me annoyed. Um, I can be annoyed. I can <laughs> be happy as well. But uh, no, uh, the, the little thing about your song, that's great. That's creative. It's wonderful. It's good. And one of the uh, basis volunteers, a really very talented musician and, and photographer in, in London, she was running uh, the, the, the website for a while. But, I mean, she was producing a lot of music. She's doing a lot of good stuff. But uh, the thing is that if you really wanted your, your, your material to get on the broadcast, I'd be way out there. There were, from, this is what was informed to myself, uh, that there are two production houses which correct your mix. <gasps> and they, that's when they put the dodgy stuff in it. And okay. if you don't go through those two production houses, you won't get the coverage which um, you should. And I think that film, the film They Live, is one of the most iconic films that people have got to see. And uh, that's a, I, I mean, I was working at Sky TV it went way back when that came out. I mean, the Sky Television Satellite delivered TV uh, to be there at the start and it was just absolutely, was there for 20, 20, just over 21 years. Which is a magnificent experience to go through that whole change. With, and I, go, I told Rupert Murdoch, "You've got ten seconds to get out," because he was standing in front of camera two at the time. But that's the power I had at the time. I told Murdoch where to go. Wow! That's sort of wow. You know, you really, who mild? You, you know. so, you feel um, yourself as that the man who yeah. told Murdoch where to go <laughs> in the best possible taste. To mimic a former British Canadian called Kenny Everett, who was um, sadly left us. But um, yeah, I th this is I, the, th the thing about it is get empowered by knowledge, but don't get afraid of it. Right? You know, fire is a wonderful thing. It can cook your food or burn your ass. Right? right. So it's the application and containment and respect you give these things. You know, I mean, just because a shark eats your leg off doesn't make it a bad shark, right? It's just what it does. It's not its fault. You got in the way of the shark, it took your leg off. That was your fault because you were in its domain. So it's that kind of a thing. You know, 
be sensible, you know, grow up, take responsibility for your actions and, you know, don't blame everything on everybody else. It's, you know, you're the person who walked across the road when the 40 ton truck was coming while you were on your mobile phone and couldn't pay any attention. If it hits you, it's not the truck driver's fault. You know, that's called uh, a Darwin Award winner, to use a very old term. Do you remember the Darwin Awards? The Darwin Awards, I don't. Uh, it Darwin sounds Awards, vaguely familiar. The Darwin Awards were were uh, a great concept because, on the basis that uh, uh, Darwin basically the, the theory of, of of evolution is correct, let's let's just put that as said for the purposes of the. Our Darwin Award winners were announced every six months or a year for those who were the biggest dumbasses who served humanity. By getting killed, right? Uh-huh. Uh huh. In other words, there was one guy who put a military surplus rocket on the back of his uh, four by four and uh, thought he'd light it up, and then you know, one and a half miles later, I think he was doing about six hundred miles an hour at the time, he ended up going straight into a cliff, and uh, you know, was 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 that a Darwin Award winner because he's so stupid? Dumbass, you know. Uh-huh. And then the only one, the only living, uh, the only living um, Darwin Award winner was somebody who, uh, you know, those, uh, you know, those things at golf courses where you put your balls in it and you cl- you push it up and down to clean the balls between two brushes and it uh-huh. cleans your golf balls. He thought he'd leap over one of those things, and we don't really need to describe the rest of the joke, do we? He contributed to the uh, betterment of humanity by not having any <laughs> of those left. So wow. therefore he couldn't be produced, therefore he was in a Darwin Award winner. That was, you know, somebody he was so stupid. Ugh, I think you might a... call it uh, jackass. I don't know. Well, it's bad enough to have that happen to you, but then to get an award for it. Uh... Well, you know. It depends on how you why look not? at it. Yeah, yeah. You know, maybe he never had an award before. <laughs> yeah, probably the best thing that happened to him in his life, but certainly he doesn't. Uh, well, anyway. Uh, <laughs> enough uh, said. Enough said. Uh, all right. So we were gonna, we talked about talking about black goo in, in this in the second hour, and yeah. uh, so uh, there's, I'm, a, there's I'm, a lot yeah. happening on that, and there are going to be some things we're going to say. I mean, I might as well say some of it here because you're not able to come to the. Black Swan Inn and Devizes in the middle of Wiltshire Co-op Circle Country, just beside Stonehenge and Avebury. It's a wonderful part of the world here. Oh, that sounds like And fun. I've been able to settle down here for a while. Hopefully I'll be able to stay here. Um, and uh, we're having Michael Shrimpton, who's a former QC, and Michael Shrimpton's written an extremely important book on uh, secret German intelligence and the scale of infiltration of um, governments within an, 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 a, just like Stalin was working for the Germans. You know, the British Prime Minister Lloyd George was working for the Germans. And we're talking German Germans, not German people Germans. Uh, this is pre, the, I mean, uh, th- this organization, they, they were responsible for trying to blow up Hitler and it didn't work. Uh, yet they put him there in the first place. And they've taken over all, I mean, that's, that's rocket fuel, that. Um, we're also going to have some guy called Steve Bassett. And he acted in a movie called Straight Street Eyes by a brilliant Brit called Oliver, Ollie, Ollie, uh, Ollie Marshall. And he's going to, he made a great film and he ended in my film festival, Street Eyes, great. And he went around Los Angeles. You guys gave this guy a green card and he's making movies now. So... That's exciting. Oh. And then there's a wonderful girl called... Um, uh, he, so that's that's what's happening in a week's time in um, Bass's world here. And I'll be talking about the black goo. And there will be a soldier who was there when the British shipped this stuff out of Thule Island or Thule Island. But our base, the black goo is black because it's contained in black fluids um, which are made of black partic- particles, but i.e. oil, crude oil, and um, this other stuff, which is different, that the British 
recovered during the Falklands War. Now, this is available, there's some information of this available in Nexus magazine, the current edition, though, the current edition is published in Australia, but I think you have an American edition. Each major region of the world has their own editions. Uh, a guy called Alec Newell uh, wrote about this. It involves some good ETs who are trying to tell us something, and not enough, not enough of us are listening. Uh, but fundamentally, the way matter creates itself using wavefront energetics around the event horizon of whatever we got in the center of the Earth. Some say it's a black hole. That formulation of wavefronts we then call matter, right? Rocks and crystalline things are energetic wavefronts in a certain state of order. Now, the, that basic process creates H2O. In fact, I think it, H, it creates H4O2. I could be wrong in that particular chemical compound, but there's a deep inner water way down deep in the earth, which has got this wonderful energetic spiral, which some people call the Irish spiral. It's the three spirals of energy coming from, and that's a sentient, water has got its own memory and properties and all sorts of things like that. There's another substance which is found in crude oil, but isn't actually crude oil. And that, when it's exposed, uh, you know, from the earth and goes up into the water and then reaches higher temperatures, starts arranging things. If this stuff loves complexity, right? It's sentient. It has a consciousness. And it will create long chain molecules and it will build these molecules into long things which then subsequently are made into cells which create physical, biological life. And that's the fundamental process which makes the atoms do what they're going to do into molecules to create life. And that's what we're standing on, on this earth, and we're living with bodies which are designed for running around here. Okay. Uh -huh. Are we okay with this, guys? Yeah. Our our energy field, our uh, living life force, which is one of the reasons I interviewed Michael Aquino, was that we exist in a different energetic domain than the crystalline material world. Okay? Okay. Now, I referred to this earlier when John Irwin explained that that energy field, that soul, or if you want to, whatever you want to call it, when it goes into a body, it's got to go into the right one. It's got to plug into the right body. But your body is essentially made in the image or the structure of your being is made from an external non-3D bioenergetic field. Okay? Uh -huh. And when you get exposed to other forms of radiation and energy fields, and that image is somehow obscured, that's when you get sick and, you know, it all goes wrong. Now, the thing about this is that occupies bodies which this sentient world has created for us to live in. We are guests on this world. We are not from this world. And this world is very keen to make sure it stays that way and we obey the house rules. Now, what's happening is we are not obeying the house rules. And we are allowing, by virtue of us all being human, no matter what's in those human bodies, because this is one of the big problems, the predators are not actually from here, but they're able to inhabit human bodies and take control of the physical world, i.e. governments, uh, corporations, make decisions, and that way they're able to physically apply their agenda against the rest of us. Now, they tell us what they're going to do, and we let it happen. So that means we are compliant with their demands and their wishes, which means we are as guilty as they are because we haven't stopped them. And right now, if we do not take command of our own responsibilities, we're toast. We're going. Now, the predictions from a number of sources focus this because of the United States and the way they've allowed themselves to be run by these individuals who have taken global control of the planet and abusing it. And the whole mass death and destruction of everything going on is basically focused on 
these individuals who are able to live and work in the land of the free, i.e. the continental United States. Now, the predictions coming through from a number of sources is anything between seven, you're going to love this, guys. I'm in England. You're not. You're in a place called America. The predictions are 75 to 100 percent of the land mass of the United States is going to be taken out. Now, those are coming from different sources. So if I was an American, I'd start paying attention, do something about it. And that's being responsible. Now, the bottom line is that there's oil bubbling up out of the ground in Iran and it can't be refined. And some people have noticed that when they get rid of this oil, because they can't put it back on the ground, just so that people are elsewhere, just in case, case people who aren't in America get a comfortable feeling, oh, that's okay, I'll be all right. No, nobody's all right. Nobody's got a comfort zone on this. This black goo is non-refinable, and it's an Iranian oil, for an example. They can't process it, so they dump it. Okay? This stuff doesn't just lie like a lake and sit there. Somebody noticed the stuff's moving, and it isn't the wind blowing it. It's got a consciousness field. It's intelligent. So one fine day, somebody... Uh, goes down and has a look at this stuff. And um, it moves. It moves out of the lake and surrounds them. Okay? Now, this individual uh, is pretty cool, and he sort of pays attention, and he says, okay, you know, if you've got a lake of black stuff all coming around you, what are you going to do? you got to run. So he kept us cool, and a lot of these things is all down to respecting all forms of life, and saying hi, and not being hostile, and keeping it cool. So he wasn't hostile, he kept us cool. This stuff came around and said hello. I mean, what does a black fluid going to do, you know? All it's going to do is move along the ground and, you know, didn't touch him, didn't invade his space, it respected him. So he said hi to it by touching it, and he noticed that his finger, when he touched it, was perfectly clean. If it was black crude oil, you put your finger in it, it's going to come out all sticky and gummy. And oh, geez, you know, that didn't happen. Once a basic communication was established, this essentially informed him, we are here to clear up your mess. So we are either going to be part of the solution or part of the problem. If we're part of the problem, it will clear us up. And as my good old buddy... John Lear, who I have a lot of fun and respect for, basically said they're just going to clear out the Petri dish. So we've got a choice. We've got a choice of becoming responsible. We've got a choice of responsibly uh, informing those who are scrubbing around with this planet for their personal gain or their personal agenda to wipe everything out here. That is not going to be tolerated anymore. So uh, it seems that at the moment as we speak, Certain individuals are going on family leave. And the reason for that is it seems certain secrets are being placed in certain people's hands and they're feeling rather uncomfortable, so they're going out to spend some time with the family so they can start running. And I've said for some time that uh, it's time to get out of town, boys and girls, or whatever you want to call yourselves, time to leave and get out of town is now. So that's the terrestrial energy field, which is found, some people find it in crude oil, and that created life here. It is life. It is existence of life. And we are lucky to be walking around in the molecular flesh beings and everything here that it's helped create, and we're having a nice time in a nice planet, but we are abusing the house rules and like any tenant, if you mess with the house rules, you get kicked out of the house. Okay? Now, the thing about, does that make sense? Yes, it does. It does. And, you know, there's something, honest, uh, ironically, I listened to the, I, I've gotten through the first um, half, the first part of your interview with Michael uh, Aquino, Aquino today. I, I happened to um, 
deep playing it um, this morning. And uh, one of the things that he mentioned uh, now, again, uh, he you, he went into his t- temple of set and, you know, how he when he first was uh, with um you know, became a Satanist, uh, Michael, uh, uh, Anton LaVey. Uh, but the philosophy of that, uh, the reason why he himself didn't, didn't like the Christian, um, religion in the sense that it made uh, an outward savior that the Christian people tend to have that they put their faith in rather than taking the responsibility for themselves that every person need to hold themselves accountable and make those changes. And he also mentioned how with the Temple of Set, uh, there was the um, nature, there was the, the respect and appreci- appreciation of nature. And then when um, there were other, you know, um, beliefs or people that were messing with nature, like partying the Red Sea or whatever, and violating um, the actual rules of nature itself. So you, we're talking about a predator that has... and. and and I don't want to go into the morality of the belief system right now. Another, yeah, I think, I think it, there's too many triggers there, and I think you, right. you're correct in that. Uh, I right. strictly and very deliberately did not want to address – we addressed that initially about the other issues which we've discussed. And that gives everybody throwing hate and screaming and yelling. That doesn't right. actually provide a beneficial right. thing. I made a decision that – he has reached certain ranks within the U.S. military. He'd been awarded certain uh, privileges and uh, was given certain things to do. Uh, chief, chief, he was a. So I was respecting those institutions and I'm respecting the rank that he had, and I'm respecting the information that he had to give in terms of the books, in terms of war, and stopping that. To make absolutely very clear. Mr. Aquino is not baby white and fluffy toes. We're talking about a dangerous individual. You do not get assigned the rank and the kind of operational duties which uh, he had. If you were, be very, very, very about that. Uh, When I hold conferences and when I do interviews, I'm not necessarily agreeing with the individual's concern. I want to get some information about what the heck's going on about a particular issue. And that means you have to pay attention and ask questions. And you don't find out where the nuclear trigger is in a bomb if you just say, that's a nasty, nasty bomb. Uh, I'm going to say bad things about it and have a huff. If you have to go in there and find a trigger and switch the damn thing off. And that means you've got to find out what's going on. And that's why I did that. I may actually want to do another interview with him because he's the only person who so far talked about human existence outside 3D and the 100,000 years we've been around. The current set of religions we've got are basically politically expedient belief systems which are highly convenient for those creatures who've taken control of our planet. And I think that is about as far as I'd like to go in terms of those political expedient maneuvers which were used to create what we now call a system of beliefs across the spectrum. The whole spectrum of political, uh, of those beliefs are essentially a political action to um, maintain population management purposes. And I think that's about as vague I can do on that without triggering people. I understand what you're saying though. I mean, I think a lot of people are on the on the page of feeling that uh, a lot of I mean, and again, I don't want to get it. I mean, we all have our own you know intuitions of what we think is going on, and however, and I I don't I don't want to violate any of that, but I I think we can all go on that. We're pretty much on the same page, and and when you say yeah, well, I come from religions Ireland, are created to yeah, control people yeah. by the state, by the by the government, basically. Well, too. not by the government. The government's voted in and out, and they change seats and they run around and uh, do musical chairs. It's uh, this predator, uh, which is invoking um, an awful lot of things on this planetary world, which remember we're living in a multi-dimensional world uh, and they are violating every rule of the book for the purposes of their particular agenda and we have to become skilled 
aware and understand what those are. And we must do that with urgent effect. Uh, the other thing about the Black Coup, just to finish it. Okay. What they got in the Falklands were 400, what the British military got in the Falklands in 1982 was 400 crates of this stuff, which is non-terrestrial and has a different life force agenda than what the terrestrial goo has got. And there were 400 crates of that stuff. These crates were approximately 2 meters long, 2 meters wide, and 1.5 meters deep, and they interlocked. They were shaped, these tanks or crates were interlocked in such a way that they would interlock together like a zip interlocks. It was kept safe at minus 20 degrees Celsius in ice. And what happened was uh, the uh, British went in there with the Marines and the Special Air Service and the Special Boat Service, the SAS and the SBS and the Marines, and um, I think the paratroopers might have been in there as well, uh, because there was the surface base, and according to Alec Newell, uh, which in the book published uh, through Nexus Magazine, Coevolution, and David Griffin, my research colleague David Griffin, has done a lot of research on this, and that initially was published with a basis interview three or four years ago, four years ago now, and we had hoped that he would be available to do an update, but there are issues which prevent that at the moment, so that is why I am speaking. Uh, this, the British had, when they went in there, in Thule Island, and if anybody knows about the German secret societies, what the hell are we dealing with the Thule Island in the South Atlantic and a Thule base in Greenland in the North Atlantic in uh, the North Pole? This is a Thule Island in the South Atlantic, in the South Georgia ring of islands, which were occupied with three, at that time that base had three Argentinians, <coughs> sorry, three Argentinians and one American. The British went in there. The story is, the narrative is that uh, the Argentinians were dealing with blue, grey ETs in dealing with this material. And it was extraterrestrially sourced. Some other sources are saying it was effectively distilled from a deliberately targeted meteor storm that landed in the southern regions of the planet. And the fact that the Germans had a base there, it's called Thule Island, which means they were doing esoteric work there, is extremely alarming because those Germans effectively still control the planet through many, many intelligence agencies, governments, uh, and other forms. And these, when you're talking Germans, you're not talking about Germany Germans. You're talking about people who go back, I believe, to at least the Bavarian era, where they initially started work on the uh, manufacture of changing of human DNA so reptilian ETs could exist as humans. And we're going back 400 years so we've got a very complex agenda running here, and there's other issues involved, not all of them available. My latest understanding is that the British were shipping, um, I don't like using the British, you know, I'm Brit British country, uh, but from a point of view, three groups or three large supply uh, truckloads of this material were sent to three main bases in England or Britain. One of them near the southwest of England, uh, the base commander said, what is this stuff? You're not, I'm having nothing on my base unless I know what it is. Well, he's dead now. And so are a lot of his uh, fellow soldiers who were there to protect the base. Now, this is news from 10 years ago. Now, I did ask the source about some verification on this, but he didn't give it to me. The other information is that this stuff is being used to create, quote, soulless beings. Now, the British, the whole point of bite bases was that a British intelligence officer, end of the World War II, found a base in Germany, stroke Austria, at the close of the war, and found a lab where strange-looking humans were being created or they were there. Now, the, uh, the various movies like Outpost, 
that come to mind when this comes along, and a strange-looking aircraft. Now, that British intelligence officer got sick. There was some kind of illness he got, and the Americans came in. This stuff was brought to England, and they started manufacturing aliens here in England, in Berkshire, and in Porton Down, in the bases very close to where I am. Some of those programs, the, 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 the technical creation of the process IVF, in vitro fertilization, was developed to make these things in those British bases. And subsequently, that technology was then used in human infertility because the whole point of using this in vitro fertilization is to make sure that you keep making infertile, defective human bodies, which will eventually die out. Okay? That's hard Uh for people who don't want to get pregnant. But the bottom line is you're attacking, as we started earlier, you're attacking the primary male the dominant male, which means you're attacking the good genes which will survive and make that species physically survive in a harsh environment. Our initial form here was the Sasquatch. We're all ETs, and all of us have been brought here under different times, the most recent ones being the black races. That's why they know more about this, which is why there's so many combinations of transracial, redhead, uh, uh, primary uh, human uh, bioframes which were created here uh, mixing with the uh, black races and it's very significant that that's the situation with the current royal family There's I was important, just thinking about there, that there are very important reasons for this in terms of the biogenic survival of the species but the primary target is to make sure none of the primary source energy sources i.e. souls can ever reincarnate in this 3D domain. That is part of the takeover. That's what Irwin was fighting for in 1959. Wow. Once you lose your genetic coding, for that pineal gland to sing, you will never be able to reincarnate in 3D ever again. That has happened to the original people who built this. the... Uh, the pyramids, remember we're dealing with 100,000 years here. Whoever built those pyramids, all that graffiti you see in the pyramids is a load of hocus, baloney. It's not by the pyramid builders. They just find them. And that's why there's so much baloney about the pyramids uh, because those doing it are, well, not said. Are we getting a picture here? Yeah, I am. I, 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 it's, I, it's almost like I had to, I had to take a pause. It's, it's mind blowing. It's, it really is. The British were making uh, soulless beings for use on the lunar base. Now think about that. The Do British, they have a hive mind? I mean, how are they? No. no. The whole point about these things, program generated life forms, uh, and don't want to get too annoyed with some of our American researchers who um, seem to think that everything happens with a grey and a ductee. Uh, there's a brilliant woman here we haven't talked about called Maria Wheat- Marie Kayali. There's another brilliant woman here called Maria Wheatley. Maria, uh, and well, what's the time? Uh, it's uh, where it's uh, we've. 3.34 here. Um, we've got right. about... Okay, well, we're going to speed along. We've done the black goo, right? Right. Okay, yeah. Wiltshire, right. Bases here, right. They're making aliens. Program generated life forms. Um, the first base, which was on bases one, AL-499, is near a town called, a little village called Peasmore, and is under the... Well, there's an awful lot of stuff under the ground in this country. As a good old friend of mine called Bill Uhuis told me, Everything's going underground, he said. Elon Musk's been given the uh, the Welsh bases in the South South Wales and some of the uh, the bases in um, in Scotland for this hyper tunnel network. And of course, the hyper tunnel network's already there because it's been there for thousands of years. One of the main hubs is near Manchester. So what he's going to do is just put a a modern ticket stall outside the front. He'd go hyper speed into whatever you know using the old ET ancient, ancient tunnel network. But anyway, um, so the British are making aliens in Berkshire, uh, North Agreement, Greenham Common. We don't need to go into too much detail. 
there's the Germans involved there, the Russians involved there, the, the Aussies and the, the other, the others. Uh, and these things are program generated life forms and they look like, um, they look like greys, but they're not looking like greys. And that is what the alien autopsy was all about. And I've spoken to Spiros, who made the alien dummy. That was 100% you know, man-made prosthetics. No matter what Fox Television would tell you. And I was there at the very start when this fiasco happened way back in 19, 20 years ago. What Spiros t tuned into was he, st he tuned into the types of things they are making in these bases, which look a bit human and um, asexual and um, sort of also look like greys. These things would... That's what the that's what the logo of the basis project's all about. It's got a hand saying stop this, right? Uh, stop this transhumanization agenda. Because this has happened before, and some other Falklands veterans have briefed me on how a very weakened, grey-looking being uh, was actually living in a house in Birmingham, of all places, and uh, she was designated Anne. It was called Anne, and her message was. Don't become like us. And that is what we are right now headed towards. A severely weakened, very, very pathetic but controllable uh, being which used to be us humans. Strong, multidimensional, intelligent beings who could dimension hop anywhere as we wished one of the most beautiful beings made on, in the universe is the human. And uh, right now it's going the wrong way. And we've got to fix this problem. We, we do have, a, uh, have to have to fix it. That's just uh, it's absolutely frightening. Now, you mentioned, uh, now, is it Thule, Thule Island? Is it T-H-U-L-E that they yeah, were doing it's this? Thule, it's Thule, T-H-U-L-E. Uh, right. There's Thule Base, which is a U.S. base in Greenland. Uh, up in the Arctic, and uh, where these, um, I mean, the, uh, we don't even need to talk about what's going on in Arctic, uh, the, 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 so much stuff going on, that's a whole different ball game, and I don't know enough about it, but is it, the Germans is it had, a, had a submarine named after base. The, I have a question, though, is it is it named after the Thule Society? Yes, that's the point. Okay. So when yeah. you have, a, when you've got an island named Thule Island, and you've got a German submarine base, excuse me, hello? Yeah, yeah. And Admiral Byrd goes down there with 6,000 troops and says, oh, I'm very sorry, I'll just go back home. Sorry to have bothered you. 1952 or whatever it was. We, we do have... I mean, a, anybody, anybody paying attention here? Yeah. No, to I mean... connections... Of course. I mean, yeah. to, to think about like uh, what you know what was happening at that time, and and then that goes all the way back to uh, World War Two and Hitler and and uh, you know it the was a forming... complete fraud and full control of the United States was then fully enabled after that on the CIA. I mean, there's a whole pile of history on all this. You know, Eisenhower, German asset. Lloyd George, German asset. Right. Right. So that little speech that. Eisenhower did about the uh, industrial military complex is a little bit in your face, tongue in cheek, boys. The connectedness. Eisenhower, it is said, delayed the the rations and the extra food for those horrent so that those horrendous pictures could be made. Just um, anyway, that's a whole different ball game. German asset. And if you want to hear about that, listen to Michael Shrimpton. He's been on bases a few times. Who? I just, mean, as, just as in, in Northern Ireland, uh, because the Irish are waking up in Northern Ireland, 1960s, if you want to listen to the songs of Van Morrison, I've been very honored to meet Van Morrison. We had dinner. We had lunch, rather. I didn't expect, I didn't think he didn't expect me not to pay. But anyway, I want my lunch. Um, his songs... And the, in, the wonderful sensitivity of Van Morrison's music in the 1960s indicates that at that time, the Irish were waking up. And that could not be allowed. So, 
the Germans who uh, this I don't like saying Germans because this is a lot of this is before Germany of we know today ever happened. Uh, the Germans had their ass kicked in World War Two. A lot of people died, and if they only knew who did it, they would possibly get a bit annoyed. Um, because the Irish are waking up, and they could not have the Irish waking up because the Irish are the survivors, the so-called Irish. Again, the term Ireland is a very recent term, as in turn as is the British term. Britain, Britain is only called Britain. Great Britain is only called Britain because of Brittany in France. So we can blame the bloody French on this. It's always convenient to blame the French, especially when you don't have a point to make. Just blame the French. <laughs> Probably right. And I had a French girlfriend, and she would kick my ass up by saying that. Okay, so the thing is that because things were waking up in Northern Ireland, they had to shut that down. So the German intelligence agency, the DVD, brought in relevant players, and bingo, the provisional IRA was created. That created the troubles, and the troubles were kept going, as a lot of people are now beginning to see. When things started to settle down, a bunch of real nasty bastards walked around shooting people creating extremely nasty uh, political uh, uh, disruptive situations. And I'm very uh, meek to to be part of a process which helped heal that. And we got a healing situation when KISS FM broke Matrix in 1987, 30 years ago. We cracked. We caused a little problem in a program in Northern Ireland. And that was KISS FM. And that was my radio station with another bunch of people that we created that with, including my dear late colleague, uh, Jeff, who's not with us anymore. In the Republic, they kept on growing, but they didn't start waking up until the 1980s. And this is when the whole thing about pirate broadcasting comes into steam, because pirate broadcasting broke the mind control of the, of the state broadcasters, which allowed those individuals to wake up. And that is why the basis conference in Ireland, the uh, two weeks, two months ago, was called Ireland Awakening. There's another gentleman who did that. It was a guy called Terry Hooley, who is responsible for lots of things going on in Belfast, and that's another story. But he broadcast out of my bedroom while I was at the BBC playing his reggae show, running a pirate station, and I had to go to the BBC in Northern Ireland, which I worked for for five years, and just had to sit there drinking Guinness because, okay, how could I possibly have anything to do with this pirate station when I'm here in the sanctity of the BBC club, drinking Guinness. Guinness is a good beer. It's 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 um, it's. It, do you know what the worst thing on the face of the earth that ever happened? Forget about what? all this stuff. Just been talking just to lighten the the mood. Uh, everybody used to say, "Oh, the best Guinness is brewed in Dublin." Well, when everybody was saying the best Guinness, the best Guinness is brewed in Dublin, it was actually made in England. Now, just think how bad that is. <laughs> Could you? Uh, okay, I'm just lighting the lighting the mood. Anyway, they only made it in Ireland for relatively recently again. So anyway, that's that's one of the great travesties of life. Forget about who sank the Titanic. That was a German thing as well. Well, you okay, know, we have, so where are we now? Uh, we are at uh, about uh, eleven minutes left. I in think. terms of what are we talking uh, about? 12 what, minutes. What we uh, well, we were talking about, uh, you know, uh, the black. Go- well, you know what? We've got a little bit of time left, and I, I, I do want to make mention of, of Max Spears a little bit I, yeah. before before we go. Okay, uh, right. What is, is there any, anything new on uh, about him? Okay, the basic story of Max is that um, I met Max for the first time at the Super Soldier Summit uh, in, near Las Vegas, in Henderson, Las Vegas. We got on very well. Uh, was he was with his beautiful girlfriend Sarah, uh, and that was a great time, and uh, we had a really good time, and it was great when he came to England, and uh, when I interviewed him in England, uh, we had so many agents flying around in Canterbury, uh, we actually, you know, we actually outed two of them, and uh, one of them came over, oh hello Miles, yeah, you know, uh, good to see you, you know, but they were two agents. But the basic rule is once they, once you're, uh, once they, once you're exposed, bingo, game over, go home. So it was, you know, it was nice. Oh yeah, and the same people who tried killing me five times uh, since Max's death. I had three attempts poisoning the temple of Set. Remotely were trying to bump me off, poison me. Similar poisons and things. There's a whole lot of story on that. There's uh, two attempts in the car. 
where I sat in the car and this voice in my head, we're about to kill you. You are about to die. You know, and I says, oh, that's very nice. So drove on anyway. <laughs> oh. It was the cruise control, eh? They, they, they banned jacks. So that happened twice. So they've been trying to bump me off for a while and I'm still here. So that should tell people, um, uh, something. Uh, so that happened after Max. So the point about Max was that on the lead up to that conference, I'd been speaking in Poland twice. This was the second time. They're very nice people. A uh, very nice lady called Monica Duval wanted to develop bases into different languages in um, in Germany and in Poland and in 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 um, in uh, Europe, speeding on very quickly. Very nice civilized thing. I was very impressed by the Poles. The Poles are very switched on. They did a very good job. Lots of very intelligent questions. Uh, loved Warsaw. Great place. Um, great people. But there was a plot. And that plot I outed because uh, after speaking at Kerry Cassidy, I've, speak, I've spoken at a lot of Kerry Cassidy's uh, conferences here in the UK. Thank you very much, Kerry. Uh, so speeding on very quickly, I just finished speaking uh, on that July day and uh, walked out, switched on the phone, and I got these three text messages, a couple of text messages repeated. And I looked at them and it just said, Max is dead. Cutting a very long story short, made the phone call, talked to Monica. She's in tears, totally distraught. Uh, also got text messages from Madeline, uh, the other Polish girl concerned. We don't need to go through the whole thing here. But the bottom line is that there was a problem that after crying and crying and crying, suddenly Monica's tone changed and uh, there was hope maybe Max could be revived. I got a con confirmation from the other girl, Madeline, that Max was definitely dead. Dead, dead, dead. Not dead, but dead. I mean, not coming back dead. Yet, Monica's people were trying to revive him. At that point, uh, a very kind gentleman, very wonderful gentleman called Stuart Sferdlow, who I interviewed in, in London, and he's a very decent guy, he, for some reason, puts a veiled, pointed dis, uh, remark on his website uh, saying some English researcher, which I took as referring to me, was deluded in that Max was fighting for his life. How silly, how, how, how terrible. And I thought, that's a bit nasty, Stuart. But there's not a chance in hell that Stuart Sferdlow was going to get involved with any dumb murder plot for Max. It's not going to happen. So if anybody thinks that Max was bumped off by Stuart Sferdlow, don't be so stupid. The man's dead. Now the point is, if he's dead, why are they spending four or five, six hours trying to revive him? And then a whole lot more information comes through. It then gets all very nasty. Uh, I was on bad terms with Sarah because I'd had Max and Sarah at my conference three times, I think, by then. I didn't need them then. They didn't sort of have a right to be at the conference. And Sarah thought I was being very nasty to her. So, look, Max says, look, Miles, just deal with me. I'll deal with Sarah. Just before Max is da about daddy two days before, or three days before he died, he said, Miles, I'm going to give you the best conference you've got. I'm going to give you some really good stuff. A month later, you know, he's dead. You know, or he, or he was dead three days later. The point about it is, and I've done check this with Vanessa, the basic analysis of the situation is, and remember the polls, they put it all up online, and if they put it up online, why would they do that? There's a lot of questions need to be asked here, a lot of questions not being answered so why did they do all this? There were question marks over this. I mentioned this on the Kerry Cassidy show, and the shit hit the fan. And that was two days later. There is a problem here in that there's a method that was described to me, which another individual described in a public domain, which I think is a little bit too much coincidence there. As of a couple of days ago, uh, the coroner in London has postponed this again. None of the individuals in Poland are going to speak. Monica Deval is gone, vanished. Another couple of people can't be contacted. And nobody in Poland is going to speak at any English cor coroner's court. So the judge here, according to Vanessa, is saying, we want to get to the bottom of this. Which is good because the initial analysis of this would have been, it would have been a whitewash. I told Monica, I told Vanessa, Max's mother, that, um, there's going to be two autopsies you're going to need to do. One, 
the official results are going to be clean because there is no way that the polls, if they have bumped them off, are going to release a body to Britain to put them in jail. It ain't going to happen. They're not stupid. Secondly, keep some of your own data so you can have it looked at subsequently later. So we have to see about that. So right now, the rest of the stuff's all in the hands of the police, the relevant Interpol and all the relevant agencies. I did my bit at the time. I've done my little bit now, and that's the, that's max over, right? So whatever happens is that's that. Uh, so are you, when you say that they're not going to give the body uh, for them to, you know, incriminate uh, them, no, but no, are, are, you, are you, are you it's saying that it's probably not his body that was sent over? Do you think maybe um, it was not his body? There's a possibility that that might be the case, but Max ain't around. The body that was that got to England, uh, remember, it had, could not be embalmed. Yes. It had to come over by road because you couldn't fly it. Well, you couldn't fly an unembalmed body. Poland's a long way away, and what arrived was basically a black husk. Now, analysis, there's all sorts of analysis you can do on this, which is not fruitful to do here, uh, but... The process of being dead and reanimated, I was allowed to talk about on BBC Radio 4, prime time in the evening, called the pre-PM program. The BBC let that go out. That was a recorded interview, and they chose to include that interview and what I was saying about engineering and a weaponization of things beyond death, which is why the interview with Michael Aquino is so important, because we're dealing with a whole domain outside 3D here. And it's weaponized, and it's getting very nasty, and we're in a lot of trouble on that. Well, Miles, you've you've, you've definitely uh, piqued another uh, interest and direction into uh, what what's been going on, and uh, I I want to thank you for that. Uh, we are uh, ending. Uh, you know, I've got like we've got maybe a couple more minutes here left on the show. Uh, again, I, would you like to plug any of your events and uh, places where our listeners well, can the, find the, you? We had a very good Irish Dublin uh, grind, grind crew uh, run by. I mean, we're, the great thing about the Dublin thing was I have this beautiful African German girl called Katharina Kavungu who's can see alien implants in people and heal them, and she's got a successful practice in Dublin. And I thought that's cool. So uh, that was good. We had a very good time in Dublin. We hope to have another one there next year. I do want to have a much more elevated uh, conference in the UK dealing with artificial intelligence. One of the biggest centers of British artificial intelligence is in the University of West, Western England in Bristol, right beside Bath, right beside Britain's big secret underground bases. Cathy Morgan's done a huge amount of work on that. This area of England is Alien City. Transhumanization City, cyborgs, it's all happening here. We've got to find out what's going on. Red and Black Films made a great film about this. Uh, it was shot in Wales and in, um, it's called The Machine. They nicked John Irwin's uh, title, The Machine, and they shot it. Go, what's that movie? It's British making transgenic, synthetic, cybernetic beings. And I won't spoil the plot. But that's a whistleblower, boys, and it was shot at Newbury, uh, Greenham Common, where the underground base that Barry King initially said was the entrance to where they made these aliens all those years ago. Well, oh, uh, we're at the end of the show here. Thanks again. I ho Hopefully you'll come back again and visit yeah. my show another Thank time. Thank you very much. W uh, thebasisproject.org. We welcome donations. Welcome donations, yes. And thank you for listening to the Freedom of Joy show. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll be back on Tuesday. Until then, uh, God bless. Good night.